people, I'm Sadie Well, and today we're going to be making a corset again. Except <laughs> I did that same thing that I did last time where I call it a corset and it's actually closer to a pair of stays. So I'm sorry, but the algorithm doesn't know what stays are. So cottagecore may have risen to fame over the pandemic, but my desire for it and love for it is not dead. My ability to afford it, however, kind of is. So for this video I am giving myself the challenge of making a beautiful pair of stays for less than £20. However, <laughs> I know most of you here are from the US, so in US dollars that would be... Hey Google, how much is £20 in US dollars? $23 and 64 cents or thereabouts and hopefully by the end of this video I will have a beautiful cottagecore staple for my wardrobe that won't have put me into further debt than I'm already in. I am however going to add a little disclaimer here. When I talk about making things on a budget and the fact that I can make something for less than a certain amount of money that's not me saying that you shouldn't spend more than that certain amount of money on that thing. Things like corsets and stays and very cottage y stuff is not exactly available on the wider market. And yes, I'm ignoring all of the fast fashion imitations of corsets we've had over the last couple of years because that's not really what I'm going for. Because this stuff is hard to get in the mainstream, it means you normally have to go to small businesses, independent creators, and that's fantastic. We love supporting small businesses and independent creators. If you want something that looks like this, and this, and this, and this, and you have the funds to do so, you should absolutely support these creators. If I had the spare cash, I'd be doing it too. People like French Meadows, Cottage Cool Wear, Red Threaded, they're just... the skill that these people have is just phenomenal and the reason these things cost hundreds of pounds when they're made by independent businesses is because I'm not taking into account the time it's going to take me and an hourly wage for that. I'm not necessarily going to be using all the best quality materials and I don't need to boost the price in order to give myself a profit margin so that I can reinvest in my business because it's just me. So please don't take this video as me saying stop giving your money to these lovely businesses. This is just a personal challenge because I am in financial hardship. With that said, we've got a corset to make. Let's go. We're not going strictly historical for this one, so I'm using this classic Butterick pattern. You've probably seen it in millions of other videos. I know Rachel Maxey has used it more than a couple of times. So I want to go for view C because it's a little bit longer in the waist than something like A, which means that if I want to tuck it into a skirt or something, I can, or I can just leave it with this lovely, like, pointed down to the front bit here. However, I am going to leave out the peplum on the back. For the fabric, we're going more like dark cottage core or somewhere between dark academia and cottage core because you guys know me and I just love forest green. And I found this in the remnant bin of my local fabric store for £2.80. This was kind of the inspiration for doing this whole thing on a budget. So yeah, we're gonna have that as the outside fabric. I've actually already cut and stitched the fabric that I'm gonna use for the lining with the pattern pieces because I was using this for mock-ups to figure out the size and oh my God, am I glad I did. So I'm normally a UK size 12, which I think is a US size eight, but I completely forgot that whole thing about US and UK sizing. So I just went for the 12 and even that was way too small for me. And I didn't think to look at the measurements before I cut it out. So my original the original one had a waist of 26 and a half inches. And let me tell you, your girl does not have a 26 and a half inch waist. I don't think I've ever had a 26 and a half inch waist as an adult. So I ended up having to do three practice rounds until I got to the right size, which was the 16, because that one has a 30 inch waist, which is still a little small, frankly. I'm more comfy in a 32, but as this is a corset, it's gonna have like lacing down the front. And so I can have that a little bit wider if I need to. Or if I'm really feeling like a bougie 18th century high class lady who sits around and doesn't have to do anything all day, I can tight lace. But as we should know, this is not the normal practice. <laughs> so I did make all of my mock-ups out of the fabric that I am going to use as the lining. I've got tons of this fabric. I've got like five yards of it, which is why I was able to do that. However, if you don't have loads of the fabric that you want to use for the lining, you can use a bed sheet, you can use any kind of like scrap fabric that you have, basically anything to keep the cost down. <laughs> so the fabric I'm using, it's a cotton, I want to say it's kind of like a cotton canvas. It, it's quite stiff, but it's nowhere near as thick as a coutille, which might be used for other kind of corsets. So this is going to be the inner, and then we're going to have the velvet as the outer, and then that's it. I'm going to put some bones in the middle of it, but I'm not doing like interlining or anything like that, because of course it doesn't need to be super 
super thick. It just needs to be strong enough to withstand the force that you're putting it under. Another great thing about this green velvet is that it's non-stretch. So I'm not gonna have all of the issues that I had with the Animal Crossing Regency reticule with the stretch velvet that I had there. prefer just weighting patterns down and drawing around them. You get the wavy unevenness where the pins go in, but it's really important that these don't move around while I'm drawing around them. You can get away with it in something like a skirt, but <laughs> in something like this, you're really gonna notice it. So I'm just sucking it up and using pins and I'm just gonna be really careful when I'm drawing that if there are any curvy bits, I'm just kind of following the where the line should go rather than every single little curve in the paper. Of course, this probably would be less pronounced if I was using the original tissue paper of the pattern but I've just drawn over the pattern in baking paper just so that I didn't have to cut it out and then get the size wrong. Okay I found a solution I just did away with the, the cutting board for now because I can just pin directly into the rug that's underneath. Now obviously <laughs> I'm not going to be able to go over this with the rotary cutter with it like this but I can draw around the outlines, put all the marks on and then take the pins out, put it back on the cutting board for cutting it out. So it's perfect. Also, I realized that I've left like the tiniest little gap here and not so much at the top. That's just because the waist was like ever so slightly too small and I'm just giving myself like the tiniest bit of room in the back panel. selfies she can't see me because of the net curtain but she's like hanging out the window like this with her head on the side of the window thing and getting a selfie at that angle she's really going for it she's getting all those angles this is really awful i would hate it if somebody spied on me while i was taking a selfie so let's talk about boning 
this kind of boning, obviously. So I just so happen to have a roll of synthetic baleen, synthetic whalebone corset boning. Now obviously the most budget friendly thing you can do is to use what you already have. So if you already have corset boning, fab, go ahead and use it. However, I want this thing to be 20 pound from the ground up. Like not quite absolutely everything I use. So clearly I'm not factoring in the sewing machine into that equation, but I do want the materials that I'm using to be within that budget so that somebody could watch this video and go, yeah, I'm gonna give that a try. And it's not quite as gate kept <laughs> as whimsical, historically alternative clothing sometimes is. I believe this was 23 pounds-ish for the roll of 25 meters of six millimeter boning from I think it was from Vina Carver Design. I'll double check that, but I'm pretty sure that's where it was from. And it's really good value if you're planning on making loads of corsets. However, if you've never made a corset before and you're just trying it out and you don't know whether you're gonna be wanting to make any more, having 25 meters of this is a bit pointless and it's expensive. It's also super wasteful because you end up with a, a whole roll of something that you may never use. So what can we do instead? Zip ties. I've never personally used these, which is why I really want to try them out in this project, but I've watched a lot of videos on Emily Shields' Instagram. So that's our shield maiden. I believe I've mentioned her before. She's an incredible creator who focuses loads on more budget friendly versions of historical clothing and cosplay and the builds she makes are incredible. Like, you would not guess they were made on a budget um, with stuff from charity shops and stuff like zip ties or whatever, but they're amazing. So I really want to try this. I went to my local hardware store, or B&Q as the Brits will know it, and I got this huge pack of 50 7.5 by 400 millimeter zip ties. I didn't need this many, however, the cable ties that I could find in like my local pound shop and whatever, they weren't this structural, they were a lot flimsier, so it really depends on what you can get your hands on. If you can go to your local like pound shop, dollar store, whatever, and find zip ties that seem like they're gonna be sturdy and good, then great. I think these were about four pounds for the pack of 50, which, you know, is, is more than I might have paid in a pound store, but as I say, I'm gonna get the structural integrity from it. In terms of how these two compare, obviously this is 7.5 millimeters and this is six millimeters, so one's a little bit thicker, but you can get this in bigger sizes as well. So the synthetic baleen does have quite a bit more rigidity to it. This one is a bit more flexible. I mean, over short distances, you really can't tell. It's, it's when you're going over like the long distance that you can feel there's a bit more resistance in this one. It's difficult to show on camera, but yeah, this one is generally a little bit more loosey-goosey. But I, I think that's gonna be okay, to be honest, because all the bone is doing is making sure that the fabric doesn't scrunch up this way. As long as it is solid enough, as long as it's li not like literally squishing, I think that's gonna be fine. Uh, anyway, I do wanna try it because if and when I do run out of this stuff, it might be a nice alternative. <laughs> So in order to press these seams, what would be ideal would be a tailor's ham, which is like a big, solid, rounded thing that you put underneath curves like this and it just like plumps out the curve so that you can iron over it. I don't have one because I keep meaning to get one and then keep forgetting. So for those of you who also don't have a tailor's ham, I'm gonna provide a couple of alternatives. Firstly is this curved bit on the end of the ironing board. If you find the right bit of the curve, you can kind of like fit that over and press it on there. This does of course depend on the curve that you're pressing. It may not be able to perfectly fit over this side. <laughs> it's also not super ideal if you have a drippy iron like my one, as you just saw there probably. Ow! But it works in a pinch. The other option is to find something that can double as a tailor's ham. So like if you have a particularly stiff cushion, that has like a rounded edge on it. For me, I have a self-wound ball of yarn and this is quite tight because I wound it myself. This is where I was unraveling a jumper to use the yarn, but it does kind of work quite well as a tailor's hand because it is quite stiff. And you can see from that 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 seam is getting nicely pressed out. Now, obviously, depending on what the type of yarn is, like this is probably polyester, so if I wanted to be a bit more careful, I could put a little piece of fabric between this and the ball of yarn so it doesn't melt. But yeah, generally there's something that you can improvise with. You don't always have to have the things that cost all the money uh, and require you to leave the house or wait for an order to arrive, which is another thing I hate doing. I wonder what's this red button do? Dumb ways to die. So many dumb ways to die. Dumb ways to die, so many dumb ways to die. 
So if I'm gonna fill these seams down and put the bones between them, just to make it easy for myself, or easier, I'm just measuring, roughly measuring like how much I would need and just folding it over a little bit less than that, just so that I've got a little bit of leeway with the stitching and then pressing that down and then just kind of going along the whole length of the seam allowance and doing the same thing. And then every so often just kind of double checking that that's gonna be okay. It's not gonna be perfect because it's on a curve and that always makes things a little bit tricky especially when you're folding stuff in but it's gonna be good enough so when i'm pressing the seams on the velvet side firstly i shouldn't have my iron as hot as it is but i can't be asked to adjust it so there we go i've just got a scrap bit of the same velvet and i'm just gonna place it like right side down onto the right side of the velvet. So essentially, so if these are the little piles that make up the velvet, this is the surface of the velvet, these are the little bits that are sticking up that make it all fuzzy. The little piles from the top bit and the bottom bit are just gonna help protect these guys from getting just absolutely flattened by the iron, you know? So I just put that down there, right side down, and then just like, I'm just being really gentle with it, especially as my iron's a bit hot. fully bound the top and bottom edges. We need to do this side edge. We're not doing the edge that connects to the back panel because that's gonna be done later, but we need to do the front. And because this is the front, we're gonna be having lacing holes here, which is why I put a bone down this bit, if we remember, we have a bone there. And I also want a bone on the very edge so that those lacing holes are like braced from either side so the fabric isn't going to pull on pucker when the lacing's pulled tight. Essentially how I'm gonna put this bone in is uh, the binding is like exactly the right size to encase a bone. <laughs> it's gonna be a little bit touch and go, but I did do a test of this and it worked. So what we're gonna be doing is attaching this on like normal, stitching that down that groove line there, and then when we fold it over and go to fell that on the other side, before we fell it, I'm gonna insert the bone either just literally between the binding and the fabric here, or I'm gonna pop it in between the layers. So it's like a little bit more cozy encased in. You know when I said, oh, this binding is just the perfect size for these bones, it's gonna be tight, but we'll make it work. I did not account for the multiple layers of fabric that were also gonna be in that little sandwich. So, if we put a bone in here, this does not, in fact, 
stretch down to the stitching. Which isn't the end of the world, because this is on the inside, but this is already fraying. If I stitch this to here, it's gonna come undone super fast. So what I'm gonna have to do is, when I am pressing this seam so that this lies flat, I'm also gonna press this so that we just have a little bit more room to work with and this fold over is just a bit thinner. So when we pull it over like that, it's gonna have enough room for our bone to slip in there. with something like mildly cool and yes I am in my pajamas so we pinned the back panels together the lining and the main fabric but because this is all like cut on the bias there's been some stretching and the velvet is generally a little bit more squishy than the solid canvas so we've got things like this happening even on the front it's perfectly lined up so what I'm doing is when I'm tacking it I'm tacking it on the back so that I can see exactly where that is and I'm not gonna like miss any bits of it and then once it's tacked and I've got the pins out I'm then just gonna trim off the excess but because I pinned it on the other side all of the little sticky outy pointy bits are on this side which inadvertently has made things loads easier because normally when I'm basting on something that has pins in it when you go to pull this needle the slack if you will in the thread invariably gets caught on a pin and it's really annoying but because the only bit that's happening on the back where the sticky outy bits is like directly in and out of the fabric this doesn't get caught on anything and it's actually been a lot quicker and easier so I think I might just make that a thing where if I'm pinning something to baste it, I do it on the other side. Like the only downside is you kind of have to watch out like where your fingers are going, obviously. But you know, it's sewing. We're all used to like getting poked and scratched and prodded by needles and pins. Yeah, just thought that was kind of cool. to inform you that the progress footage stops because I went to film the reveal this morning and deleted all of the footage off my camera not realizing that I'd only uploaded March's footage to my hard drive and not April and I don't know if you could hear it in my voice but I might actually burst into tears <laughs> I was so proud of this corset. I am so proud of this corset. And I was so sure that this video was gonna be great. And now I don't have half the video. <laughs> I just don't even know what to say. I'm really sorry. Pretty much the only thing you've seen me doing up to now is basting stuff and binding stuff. And to be fair, it was kind of a lot more of that. But it got slightly more interesting. We did a slightly more interesting seam on the back sides and all of the eyelets and lacing, gone. Just gone. Okay, so I'm gonna discuss what we did on the corset next and then do the reveal and the wrap up. And hopefully you've still gotten some form of entertainment or interest from this video, but I am really, really, really sorry for being such an absolute dingus. So on we go with this car crash of a video. Okay, here we go. Isn't she beautiful? Wouldn't you have loved to have seen the progress to get to this point? There's a little bit of wrinkling here because um, I've just been wearing it for the reveal. So, as you can see, we were successful in doing the binding for this portion here. I mean, this is just something that you've already seen, right? You already saw me doing the binding for these sections. It's exactly the same. The bit that's gonna be a little bit tricky to explain is this seam. So as you can see this seam looks a little bit different to the others. So essentially here, before doing any of this binding, you do the seam between these two. So you lay them, rather than laying them wrong sides together like you normally would for a seam, you lay them right sides together. We did this seam so that there was the two raw edges along here and then you encase that raw edge in the binding and that's when I continued 
to do the binding up around this whole panel. And after you've done that, you sort of, you get this like little flappy edge here, which then I've just stitched down. I just top stitched that so that it will be extra strong. I did think about doing a felling stitch, but the thing is with the, with the pile of the velvet, it's actually kind of difficult to tell if you're going into the fabric rather than just sort of grazing the top of it. So I just did it with a top stitch on the machine so it would be extra secure. And this means doing it that way rather than sort of doing it on the, the seam on the inside means that you've got this really neat smooth finish here and it's reinforced as well. It's a nice reinforced seam because this seam gets pulled a lot when you're cinching this in at the front. So this then goes like this, right? And it gets laced at the front and laced here. And in order to do that, we need eyelets. Now in the pattern, it recommends using metal eyelets and like, you know, stampy tool but I don't have any of those and it would be far too expensive to to do that and still stay within the budget so I've done hand sewn eyelets and these really didn't take me as long as you would think I did them with just embroidery thread I could have gone out and gotten sort of a different kind of thicker thread but I figured embroidery thread would do and I just poked a hole through both layers I I marked out the holes on this side first using the pattern and then poked a hole through both layers using an awl and widened that a bit you can see some of the extra little stitches stitches on this side here where I've run the thread through the middle of the fabric, tied a little knot and then started. But obviously you can't see that on this side. So we just have some lovely little hand sewn eyelets there, which are in fact a little bit small. It does make it a little bit of a pain to get any kind of lacing through them. We've got the same thing going on up here and then that is pretty much it. So I say I lost a lot of footage. It wasn't a ton, but it was probably the more interesting footage than uh, compared to the stuff that I've done so far, but oh well. We move on with life. These things happen. I think all that's left to do is to show you it on. corset. I am so pleased with how this went. <laughs> I actually really like how it looks with a sort of a more modern uh, style with like the flared leggings and the crop top underneath. I'm a big fan. I might actually just legit wear this out. But I mean, I would have worn it out with the dress anyway, but it just makes it look a little bit more casual. So I, uh, I really like that. It's a little bit a bit unique. Honestly, I'm still kind of reeling from deleting all of the footage because that was today. I found that out about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> so um, it's sort of difficult for me to reflect back on the project and think about how it went because I am just so upset with myself. But <laughs> I think I, I think it's turned out quite polished and, and looking quite neat. And I think that's because I, I took a lot of care to do sort of pinning and basting rather than just pinning and going straight through the machine. I think that really helps sort of smooth things out and, and make things a bit flatter. You can still see a little bit of sort of waviness in the binding. I'm not sure how to fix that. I'm not sure why that's happened, but it's not, it's not super obvious. And as I've said, sort of in a similar vein with the zip and the skirt, if anyone is looking at this binding, which is really the only binding that you're going to be seeing in any detail, they're probably not looking at the binding. And I don't, and that's not necessarily a good thing, but you know, at least the wavy binding won't be seen. <laughs> now, the aim of this video was to make a corset for under 20 pounds, which was, what did I say it was? I said it was like $23, didn't I? It's, it's like about $25. How on earth has the pound gone up since I started filming? Jeez. So the aim was to make a corset for under 20 pounds. Let's go through the costs. So I already had a couple of these things. I already had the stiffened cotton that I used for the lining. And I also already had the embroidery thread that I used for the eyelets. Everything else I bought. So we have the velvet that I got from the remnant bin at Fabricland was £2.80. The cotton canvas would have been about £3 if I bought it new. The ribbon, I got four metres of that. So that was £3.20 in total. The dark green thread was £1.89. That was for my sewing machine. The pack of cable ties was £3.85. I could have gone for a cheaper one, but I wanted the slightly thicker versions and also I now have like about 40 cable ties left so if I wanted to make any more I've got them. The Skeena Green embroidery thread if I'd have bought it the prices vary if you get it at Hobbycraft it's like £1.50 if you get it at Fabricland it's 30p 
So let's go fabric land. And the bias binding was about 50p a meter. So I spent two pounds on that. So if we're looking purely at materials, I spent 17 pounds and four pence, including everything that I already had. Or if you exclude the things I already had, I spent 13 pounds and 74 pence, which is definitely within the 20 pound target. However, I did also have to buy the pattern for this. And the pattern wasn't exactly cheap. It was £8.99 for the smaller size and £9.73 for the bigger size on Amazon. I had to go for the bigger size. So if you add the £9.73 to our previous total, then we get that it cost £26.77 or $33.48, which is a little bit over the budget, but I still think that that is a good price for a homemade corset. And also you could definitely save a ton of money if you were getting this stuff secondhand, or maybe if you have crafty friends and like they've got some bias binding that they're not using or green embroidery thread, or you can even make your own bias binding if you just have scrap fabric. Ribbon as well is something a lot of people often have already. And the inside for the cotton canvas, you could use whatever fabric you want really. Like this is stiffened, but I don't think it really needed to be. The velvet didn't stretch. And then just with the extra layer of that and then the boning, you could have just used like a normal sort of any kind of cotton you had lying around or polyester or whatever. And if you have cable ties lying around the house, this could almost be like a free project, essentially. You could probably do this for less than $10. So I don't think it's a total failure that I went slightly over budget. I think actually considering I was buying a lot of the stuff new and we're living in a cost of living crisis in the UK at the moment, it's probably a pretty good, uh, a pretty good amount to spend on a project like this. And I am gonna wear the crap out of this. I have actually already worn it. I was, I was Disney bounding as Princess Anna from Frozen because there was a Disney night at one of my local pubs. And uh, yeah, it went down a treat. It, it worked really well. So I'm gonna get a lot to wear out of this. I hope that even though the video turned out to be a bit of a travesty halfway through, I hope you've managed to glean something useful from this. And I hope you're inspired to try and use your imaginations to cut down the costs in your patterns. I think that the using zip ties for boning in a corset like I, I can't notice the difference it's really good and really cheap so yeah there are all sorts of ways to make projects cheaper and more accessible and I really want to explore some more of them going forward definitely want to do some charity shop hunting for the next project I think that's all from me subscribe if you want to see more of my face and hopefully more footage that I don't delete and I will see you next time for more cozy chaos bye and hopefully by the end of this video, I will have a beautiful cottagecore homemade staple. Fuck! Ow! <laughs> Ow! So you know what I said? Oh, this binding is the perfect... No, 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 hang on. Can we focus? So you know what I said? Oh, this binding is just the perfect size for these bones. It's going to be tight, but I can fucking work and work and work with me. I... I... <laughs> Oh, God.